Thank you, Gert, and thank you, Miroslav. Um, so I'm one of the first, uh, sci first scientific pr presentation today, and I'll be talking about the power of music. It's an interesting place to start, but I think you'll agree that music plays a role in nearly all of our lives. So this talk, I'll talk about how we can use music as a tool to understand the brain. So if you think about, for a second, what's going on in your brain as you make or listen to music, a simple answer is a whole lot. As you can imagine, music touches on emotion, memory, processing of sound, of course, motor activity as well. So we can use music as a tool to understand the brain. Um, but it goes beyond that. It also helps us understand ourselves as humans. How, how did we become musical? Where did our music and language come from? One way to study that is to look at comparative studies, looking at other animals. And of course, music has power in terms of health and learning as well. And these are topics of interest. My personal focus is on rhythm. Uh, I'm actually a drummer, so it's not a big surprise there. And, but if you think about rhythm, dance, um, rhythm is really one way that humans can tie each other together, right? If you think about going to a concert, everyone's clapping on the beat, or a rave, or a dance, or dancing with a partner. It's a basic form of communication. Um, and some have gone as far as to say this, the ability of humans to synchronize with each other is really perhaps one of the key social developments that enabled humans to, to form modern societies, larger societies. And what makes it additionally interesting is surprisingly, um, moving in time to sound is pretty rare in the animal world. So despite the fact that dogs have been with us domesticated for you know, th tens of thousands of years, there's no recorded example of a dog dancing with a human, other than you know, highly trained staged examples on YouTube. Perhaps more surprisingly, our closest relatives are not on the street playing drums, right? And there's some reasons to think that why they might not ever be, okay? It has to do with what is it about our brain that enables us to be rhythmic, and what might they be lacking? The third surprise was that we actually discovered, about 10 years ago now, a parrot that could dance. Okay, and we've continued studying this. So um, one thing that we have in common with parrots is vocal learning. So that may be one clue. But if we look a little deeper, if you think about just the simple thing of clapping your hands along with the beat of music, it seems really simple. I know not of us are, all of us are as good at that as each other, but... <clears throat> But we can all do it to some fashion. Turns out that that simple action relies on both of the major motor systems in the brain. So it's actually neurally incredibly complex. And I think it gives us a window into really how sensory and motor systems interact. So that's one big focus of my research. And because of this, it can also give us some idea about how music can be used in, in motor rehabilitation as well as learning. <clears throat> one of the things that, that humans do uh, which is, is unique as far as you know, is something called beat perception. You know when you listen to music, there's a sense of beat you want to tap your foot with. Well, it turns out that that's really fundamentally shaped by the brain, we think. So that if you take a given sound, your brain can actually interpret it by, in a sense, moving along inside, okay, kind of a feeling of the pulse. And depending on how you line that up with the music, where the one is, you can create different types of rhythms from the same sound. Um, a simpler way of asking this is, is, well, what makes an upbeat an upbeat, okay? Upbeat is just a sound like any other. Well, it's, it's where it falls in time in relation to your internal sense of beat that makes it an upbeat. So there's something fundamental that we know just behaviorally. And like a visual analog is in the sense that we can interpret different visual scenes depending on how we shift our attention. So in, th in thinking about this, we came up with some basic structural models um, what would be required for humans to have these abilities? And just to focus on one, we're looking at interactions between the auditory and motor system. And while it's pretty self-evident that sound leads to movement, that we can dance and so forth, that there's an upward um, connection, um, we've hypothesized the importance of this downward connection from motor to auditory as being really critical for enabling beat perception. Um, and then we also uh, hypothesized a, a circuit in the brain that would actually be involved in this, this motor to auditory connection. So I'll tell you briefly about how we're going about trying to test that hypothesis. 
So how do we study the brain? There are many methods, but as Gert mentioned, um, what we do here at INC, and particularly SCCN, is to look at EEG, electroencephalography, which is basically using electrodes on the surface of the brain to measure very small uh, voltage fluctuations that actually reflect the electrical activity inside the brain. Okay. So you can think of it a bit like how geologists measure seismographs on the surface of the Earth. But what really matters is not what's happening out here, it's what's happening in there. So a um, little over 20 years ago, Scott McCaig, T.P. Jung, uh, Terry Sidnowski, and others at INC kind of discovered that if they applied this technique called ICA, independent component analysis, you can actually go from the surface of the brain to talk about what's happening inside the brain. And that one discovery has really led to this fantastic world of software that's been developed here um, based around the EEG lab. And so importantly, in the case of rhythm, it can actually let us talk about what's happening in different locations in the brain. So each of these little dots is a different location in the brain. And we can actually ask of each of those, well, does this part of the brain care about music? Does it care about sound? Does it care about the beat? Does it care about movement? And, and so we can actually look at the waveforms evoked by different stimuli in those different parts of the brain. And in so doing, we can create a map, essentially, where we look at parts of the brain that are sound-related, marked in red here, and parts that are beat-related. And so we did this using an experiment where we actually were able to disentangle the beat and the sound in time. So we made very syncopated rhythms where the beat and the sound were offset in time. And so we could use that to study where the beat is happening, because um, it's really this, this sort of thing happening inside. Um, and this is in a case of pure listening, not no movement. So it's quite interesting to see that, perhaps not surprisingly, we see auditory responses in the auditory cortex. But we see the strongest beat-related responses up in the motor planning cortex. So this is the part of the brain that plans movements, not necessarily executes them. So even sitting perfectly still while you're listening to music with a beat, that motor planning area is very active. And so again, we've hypothesized that this activity is used by the auditory system to really shape our perception and our expectations. So you could say rhythm perception is inherently embodied. So even regardless of whether we're moving or not, our motor system is highly engaged and we would say necessary for understanding sound. So that opens up a whole lot of possibilities in terms of health and learning. So just one example in terms of health. This is, is not work we're doing right now, but it's something um, myself, Johanna Wagner, Scott, and Mateusz are very interested in pursuing, was the idea of using music as a way to um, rebuild rhythm in people who've essentially lost the rhythm. So this is an example of a, a video from a music therapist. And it's inevitable. Well, I'm sorry, that's not playing. Oh, it's not playing here. OK, my gosh. Sorry about that. Here we go. So this woman in blue has Parkinson's disease. And you'll see she's got many of the characteristics. Uh, a fairly shuffling, small gait, um, frozen mask feature. She's not able to walk without being led along by the aid. When the music comes on, you'll notice a transformation. So music therapists have been exploring that, but there's still lots of outstanding questions. Uh, but we think it is that auditory motor, that tight connection that makes that possible. It doesn't work for everyone. Um, it often doesn't persist after the music turns off. So is there some way we can you know, build stronger therapies? Um, <clears throat> also very interested in rhythm and development. So how rhythm can be used um, to promote you know, optimal development. So we know that uh, essentially, you know, parent-child communication is highly rhythmic. 
there's an important temporal connection between them. And if you break that, the child becomes very distressed. So there's kind of a call response, action reaction. And in fact, it's been shown that kids who drum together with adults are actually have so-called pro-social impact. They're actually more helpful, more connected, more trusting. And if you look at adults that play music together in sync, they like each other more. If they're out of sync, uh, you know, I'm not so, so sure about that guy. So there's a very strong social connection. And it turns out that also uh, your rhythmic ability is quite predictive of a variety of language abilities. So there's a strong music language link. And similarly, in a bunch of disorders of learning, ADHD, autism, <clears throat> dyslexia, rhythm is impaired. So this is a, an area of active interest in the field. The way we've been pursuing it is through a series of studies, symphony, and now the early study, which were kind of taking the idea um, of growth curves, you know, of height and weight. And this is with colleagues in the Center for Human Development, led by Terry Jernigan. And, and what they've been doing for the past decade or so is really trying to define growth curves of the brain. So how does the brain of, of a child grow over time? And how do different areas of the brain grow over time? And what we're looking at is, well, how does music change those growth curves? You know, does music accelerate the growth in certain areas of the brain? Um, and I'm happy to say we were recently actually awarded a National Endowments for the Arts Research Lab grant, um, one of six for this year. So it's creating a center for the study of music in the brain. That's part of INC and CHD. So one kind of finding that we've had so far is looking to see how actually the motor area of the brain, the size of the motor area, determines individual differences in rhythm perception ability. So again, making this brain perception link. Um, so ultimately the idea is can we use the brain to understand individual differences in development? And finally, uh, TP will talk a lot more about this, but there are a number of opportunities in emerging methods. Um, we're looking towards a future where EEG could be ubiquitous, easy to use, and, and we have a grant to look at the possibility of using EEG in the classroom. So that's just an overview of some of the things that um, I'm working on, and we'll have more time to talk during the demos. Um, we'll have a demo of a completely different topic, but um, looking at navigation. So we do motion capture. We want to connect how the brain works with how the body works. So thank you very much.